Welcome to Nine Star Newsroom. I'm Dave Hill. We have a really interesting show for you today. Uh, a little later, Jesse Kelyo from the Hancock County Public Library is going to join me for a discussion about the library's collection of Star Wars books as fans gear up for the new Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens. Uh, we're looking forward to that a little bit later. Hope you stick with us. Uh, but first, we bring you a report about the campaign to build a new fairgrounds in Hancock County. Uh, that idea has been kicking around now for more than a decade, uh, but it has new momentum now. Um, a new group of community leaders and government officials is maneuvering to set up a funding plan uh, for new fairgrounds that eventually will include a new exposition center. Uh, now this plan is not cheap uh, and skeptics are strongly questioning the scope of the project and how it's going to be paid for. But as you'll see in our report, uh, the so-called XPLUX project is exciting and ambitious. The question is, will it ever be built? Stay tuned. Every June, the Hancock County 4-H Fairgrounds comes alive with the sights, sounds, and smells of the county fair. Other than the Raleigh Festival in October, it's the biggest event on the county's calendar. Visitors come from all over to enjoy the food, the midway, and the animals. But at its heart, the fair is about 4-H and the nearly 1,100 young people who compete in projects ranging from showing sheep to baking cupcakes. Hancock County has a vibrant 4-H program, and that's a major reason why a group of stakeholders is pushing a plan for a new fairgrounds on county-owned land east of Greenfield. Supporters say the fair, with nearly 1,500 animals to show and about 3,000 other projects to be displayed and judged, has outgrown the increasingly threadbare facilities on Apple Street. The new fairgrounds would be the first phase in a long-term project to build not only a fairgrounds, but a full exposition complex on the county-owned land. Now, the cost is a real eye-opener. Uh, as much as $30 million to pay for the entire project once it's fully built over the next decade or so. Now, the initial cost to relocate just the fairgrounds, just the facilities that the fair now occupies uh, here at the current fairgrounds, would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $11 million, according to the officials who are making the proposal. Now, the private group that's in charge of the fairgrounds complex proposal wants to increase the food and beverage tax by one penny to help pay for uh, the new fairgrounds, the first phase. And then between that and other revenue that it hopes to raise through the economic development income tax and also the innkeepers tax, it should generate about a million dollars a year, according to the officials, which should be able to pay off the bonds and hopefully uh, take care of some of the operating expenses as well. But the plan does have some skeptics, as you might imagine in Hancock County. Uh, these skeptics say that the plan hasn't been well thought out. You know, they also don't like that a private group, one that has county office holders who will be voting on the project, is actually overseeing it. And of course, there's a little bit of sticker shock over that $30 million cost. The initial phase um, has to focus on the, uh, the main core buildings and the infrastructure um, needed for, the, for anything to be put out there. Uh, the infrastructure, be, uh, because of the drainage uh, and the, the water retention required from, from uh, 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 the amount of water that's drained through that facility now, the acreage and everything, uh, and then uh, the water, sewer, electric, uh, all types of uh, the, the internet, all, the, all those things um, is, a, is a huge expense. Uh, and uh, it's, it's taking up half the initial money being spent on the, pro on the uh, first phase of the project just to put the first building out there. And uh, um, that's Probably, uh, and that's that's why it's it's uh, it, it's such a benefit for us to already have the property, uh, and not have to spend uh, another few million dollars on purchasing property, uh, and uh, uh, so that's the uh, uh, the hardest part to, to to get through is the initial phase is getting all the infrastructure out there. Then the main buildings. Uh, the two anchor buildings, which is a, an exposition center of some sort, uh, the and the uh, the show arena that will and the, and the barns associated with the show arenas uh, are the uh, are the main anchors. And then 
after the first phase is completed, uh, other things can be added to it as, as uh, funding uh, comes available, plus as, as needed. Uh, parking lots can be, uh, they can start out being uh, gravel, uh, but then they can be added uh, hard surface later on. Uh, same thing with uh, more parking or stuff like that. But really the, the, the first phase uh, focuses on just getting the basics out there and getting all the infrastructure done so that the fair can be placed out there uh, and the facility can, can be used all year long uh, because the show arenas and the barns will be capable of, uh, of showing uh, you know, animals, uh, large animal shows all year long and give us more, more versatility uh, than presently we have. Our population compared to surrounding counties um, is uh, much less, but our participation in our 4-H youth program is uh, much higher than those surrounding counties. So based on the, uh, the comparison between participation and the percentage of population, we have an extremely successful 4-H program here in Hancock County. Um, that's uh, in, due in part to the amount of volunteers that we have here that are willing to uh, participate with the uh, Ag Association, with the 4-H program, help support these uh, young kids and all the things that they're uh, uh, doing with their projects. We've got over 150 adult volunteers here in Hancock County. We've got a, uh, our Purdue Extension Office staff is, uh, just does a remarkable job, not only working with the 4-H youth program, but uh, um, other agricultural education opportunities that they provide throughout the year. So um, the need for a, a new fairgrounds is uh, first and foremost about the success of this 4-H youth program. The, working within the current property here at the, um, the current fairgrounds uh, has a multitude of challenges. Um, we have um, in most recent years, it goes back about two years now, uh, we looked at building a covered horse arena or covered large livestock arena right here at the, the current fairgrounds. Um, half of the uh, available property that we have here is in a floodplain. Um, to be able to construct that facility was going to require moving one of the newest barns that we've built here at the current facility as well as uh, two or three other buildings that are currently here. We, uh, we're gonna have to build into that floodplain. That uh, facility was gonna have to be built up about 13 feet on the, uh, the low end there um, to bring it up level with the um, existing property up here. Um, that would have been built in some of the best parking area that we currently have here. And when I say the best parking area, um, that is uh, not saying much at all. Um, the, the parking facilities here is what we struggle with um, all year long, and especially during the week of the fair. Um, as we uh, experienced again this last year, um, it, it's just a, a complete mess out there when you're trying to bring that many vehicles and trucks and trailers and traffic through there. Um, there's a lot of challenges with parking. If we're going to expand the capabilities of the fairgrounds, expand the amount of people that can use it, uh, then we then uh, you know this is 30 some acres here, uh, and when we need you know double or triple that, uh, then we need to move uh, close enough to town we can still utilize uh, utilities from the city of Greenfield uh, for water and sewer, but we need to be far enough out that it's not swallowed up uh, in the middle of town in the, in, in the near future. This, hopefully, the, you know, as the last time this was moved out, hopefully this is a 50 to 100 year scenario where the facility can be maintained out there uh, and not, be, uh, not present the challenges that we're having here being set right in the middle of, of the residential area. Um, but also the access off of 40, uh, um, is a, is a great benefit. Uh, the entrances will be able to made to be able to bring in semis, large trailers and stuff like that for the large animals. Uh, and uh, I, and, and uh, personally, I, uh, I think it's a great boost for, for this side of, of Greenfield and this side of, 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 the, 
uh, of the immediate county. Uh, it's been uh, long hard in the past to get businesses located east of town and uh, this is going to bring in uh, a lot of new visitors and a lot of new income and uh, and and should uh, you know enhance the amount of jobs we have to have here in the, in the, in the county and the city and should help should help everybody economically uh, and I just think it's a uh, it's a perfect place uh, for us right now that property was purchased you know 150 to 200 years ago for the use by county uh, money for the use for a community and uh, uh, originally you know the the, uh, the the old or the county home was there where uh, veterans who come back from the war had no place to live plus orphans and people that homeless people could could live and um, uh, after that went to the side it's basically just been growing crops ever since and it hasn't been utilized for the best use of the county and uh, or the community and I think uh, this is a perfect uh, location for it. Well what we've uh, um, talked about and what uh, uh, how the project has evolved to this point we're looking at the minimum amount of facilities that it's going to take to relocate all of the fair events at one time. Um, you know we've got to have obviously um, the drainage is the first thing that gets uh, constructed out there. Uh, with this being the master plan for the, the entire project, the entire build out, there's a, a certain amount of infrastructure items that have to be taken care of and have to be addressed before you construct one, one structure out there. Um, so the retention pond, that would be uh, a part of that original phase. The uh, utilities, when we're talking about uh, water and sewer and um, electric and fiber, those utilities, you know, if you're going to at some point have a, uh, a building over here, um, but today you're planning to just build a building down here, there, there's a certain amount of that stuff that has to be um, done when, while you're at it, not come back and, okay, we'll run another 10 feet of line or we'll, we'll stretch uh, uh, another 10 feet of sewer. So um, the first phase is going to include the, the retention pond. It's going to re, uh, include all of the drainage, um, all of the water and sewer um, utilities that it will take, again, for the, the overall master plan of location of the buildings and size of the buildings and so forth. We're going to uh, start with the large covered arena. And uh, again, this goes back to what we don't have here and how this all got resurrected again. We don't have a large covered arena for our uh, um, horse and pony club to have their activities, um, their training, their showing uh, um, throughout the year and during the fair. So this uh, large livestock arena would not only accommodate that, but it would also accommodate all the other species. Um, the two attached barns to it would also be included. Um, and then one of the additional barns here would be included in that first uh, phase. So the, the first phase, we get a large enough uh, arena to accommodate all of the livestock species. Um, the, uh, uh, the horse uh, club would be the only ones probably that would need that full arena um, during their showing. The other uh, livestock groups, can we can divide that arena up and we can have multiple uh, rings going at one time when, during the fair events. Um, and then as far as uh, livestock space or, or building space under roof, um, it's going to take those two large barns and this uh, first adjoining barn here to accommodate the uh, current participation levels that we have. We've got, uh, we've got over 3,000 non-livestock projects that were shown this year and over 1,400 livestock projects shown this year, uh, this uh, past fair. So, um, you know, that's what it's going to take to, to meet those basic needs. Um, and then we've talked about the uh, uh, large exposition center and an adjoining annex to that uh, exposition center. Initial phase project would be to build the, the smaller annex building. That facility could be utilized for uh, exhibition space for our non-livestock projects during the week of the fair. It can be used for uh, uh, different events, the uh, awards programs, the, uh, uh, the queen contest, or the, uh, the public speaking demonstration contesting, um, different things like that, uh, again, throughout the, uh, 
um, the week of the fair and, and leading up to the fair. And uh, then there would also be, uh, this is uh, defined as a 4-H uh, equipment building. That would be, um, at some point in time, office space for the uh, Ag Association and the 4-H clubs, um, and it would also be storage space for um, the multitude of equipment that uh, would be needed to, to maintain and operate this facility. So initially, we'd be bu building part of that facility. Um, we would need to build the uh, main entrance, um, and again, parking relevant to the needs of that uh, annex building, um, the uh, equipment building. We'd also need to build parking uh, relevant to that large livestock arena to be able to fully utilize uh, that space. Um, and other areas of the, the grounds that you know are identified as a midway area or uh, outdoor uh, implement show area. Those areas would be uh, graded off to a, a usable surface. Um, there wouldn't be any uh, structures there, uh, but infrastructure that needed uh, electrical and again the water and sewer infrastructure. We've spent a lot of time creating this uh, design plan. We spent a lot of time visiting um, other local uh, neighboring county facilities. Um, we spent uh, uh, time sitting down and talking to those folks and listening to what they had to say and heeding the advice that they offered us. Um, I think the one thing that, that stands out um, is uh, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other facilities that they've invested a lot of money um, in a facility that works extremely well the week of the fair or, or the 10 days of the fair each year. Um, when we sat down and started designing this uh, uh, project and talking about this project, we wanted to build a facility for the, this community. Um, yes, this community has a, a remarkable 4-H youth program. Uh, we host a lot of different events during the week of our fair, and our current uh, fairgrounds hosts a lot of different events throughout the year. Um, there's a lot of citizens in this community that are not necessarily involved in the 4-H youth program and not necessarily involved in agriculture. Um, what we're trying to create is something that has an appeal to the rest of the citizens in this community. Um, by designing, uh, building, uh, sizing, locating all of these buildings, um, the intent is to attract a multitude of events, um, not just uh, uh, the fair, but uh, there's, uh, and, and sticking with the agricultural side of it, there are uh, a lot of livestock shows that take place throughout the year. Um, there are also other types of shows. You know, we could host uh, um, corporate events there. We've got uh, a lot of large uh, uh, corporate facilities here in this uh, community that are currently going elsewhere uh, to host events because um, the, the space, uh, the accommodations are, are limited. When it comes to the fairgrounds, why not dream big? Well, I have no problem dreaming big as long as there is an expectation of that we, it's a doable thing. Uh, to dream big is okay. I have no problem with that, but when we progress down the line and start getting in, into the meat of the, and substance of the proposal, that's when we're going to have to look at things of how are we going to fund them, how much funding do we have available, uh, what are the critical elements that we need to, to have to have a successful fairground? And, and that in itself is a problem because I don't think we know what the scope of the project is. Uh, we started these discussions back in April of 2014, and here we are today, and we have not had a single discussion about do we keep the current fairground and make improvements to it? Uh, do we uh, keep the current fairground and build a horse uh, equestrian facility at another site or location like the county farm? Um, do we include a multiplex uh, convention, trade center, uh, hospitality center? 
Um, there, there's been that discussion. Then there's also the discussion in the part of the plan that has been presented by the uh, Hancock uh, the County uh, Exposition and Complex Corporation also includes moving the entire Purdue uh, ext a Cooperative Extension Services Office and campus and adding to it uh, the farmer's market, a, a, food, a regional food hub, a, uh, a, a kitchen, a food processing kitchen, and then there's also been added elements to it that include uh, reception type facilities, uh, for weddings and other types of meetings. Uh, there's also been added to the plan an outdoor amphitheater, uh, also a, uh, uh, a dirt track for uh, go-kart racing and midget racing and uh, tractor pulls. So the public has yet to have a discussion, the commissioners have yet to have a discussion involving the advisory committee or the Hancock uh, County Exposition uh, uh, Complex Corporation uh, or anybody concerning, okay, where are we going? What, what's going to be the scope of our project? What's our need? How much money do we have available? And until we have those early on discussions of, okay, what's wrong with the, with the current uh, facility that we need to completely move it and completely rebuild it, I mean, uh, developing a plan at this point, I think is a little bit premature, because uh, when we had the fair this year, the county fair, uh, we did surveys too similar to what the Hancock, Hancock County uh, Exposition Corporation, uh, Complex Corporation did, and we asked people about it. I was surprised at some of the results. Um, no one is really against the fairgrounds not even myself or anybody. We just have questions about it. Uh, the discussions and the changes and differences of opinion came up about why can't we improve upon it in place because it's so conveniently located, okay? Um, why are we moving it, uh, the whole thing? Why don't we just build a horse facility for the horse people since that seems to be the immediate need? And this year, uh, Oh, they rained and rained and rained. They never almost didn't get the event in. They finally moved it to uh, Henry County Saddle Club, which is a private organization at their covered arena outdoor. It's an open arena, but it's covered. And they okay. had the facilities let me, there. Let, let me ask you this. I'm going to make you king for a day. Right. King John. Right. What would you do with, with, the, with this whole issue? Let's assume for a second that the county does need a new fairgrounds. That okay. Maybe that's one thing everybody can agree on. Yeah. What would your approach be? My approach to, be, to it would be almost exactly what the commissioners actually did back in April of 2014. They proposed to set up a county board or commission to oversee the design, construction, and development of a new fairground at the county farm site. Okay. The only thing is they never went forward on that and established that commi that commission or county board where it would be subject to the open meeting laws, the public would have an opportunity to weigh in on it, et cetera. Uh, what happened is uh, Commissioner uh, Stevens uh, established an advisory committee, and that advisory committee is actually made up of the, Han the people that formed the nucleus for the Hancock uh, County uh, Exposition Complex Corporation and they were supposed to come back to the commissioners with recommendations and stuff. And that was a good start. Only problem is that advisory committee didn't do anything. It continued on independently. It incorporated as a private corporation and they didn't come back to the commissioners until December 16th of 2014, uh, almost uh, 10, over 10 months later, with a lease in hand asking them uh, the county commissioners to sign a lease. They had no plan of how they were going to build it, what the project was going to incorporate, etc. Uh, so I would start back right with the, the, the basic fundamental thing that they were setting up, a county commission, okay? That means it's a government agency it's a, that would be appointed. Uh, I've proposed in one of my letters to the editor and everything that it have a representative from each of the nine townships, okay? And that they would 
uh, report to the commissioners. Uh, the commissioners would have total control over the project and uh, they would set up their own subcommittees and go forward. We'd need committees like a design committee, uh, a finance committee to identify the available funding sources, okay? Are we gonna use property tax? Are we gonna use income tax? Because some of the taxes or tax bases that we would use for funding are in place. Um, well, in fact, they've already identified the approach they would like to take, at least for this first phase, uh, that, that includes the food and beverage tax, which has to be right. through the legislature, uh, part of the economic development income tax, pres presumably, and also part of the innkeepers tax. Okay, they have not presented publicly that, that plan. Dave. I know there's been discussion of, of some of that stuff, okay, at least, well, at least two of the items. But, yeah, they that, will that, not, but those would not put a dent in the total cost of what the plan they have put on the table. They put a master plan on the table, and you'll have a picture of it right over there on the wall. That was the only document they have presented to the public, and they call that a master plan. Now, if you look at that plan, there is no breakout on the size of the buildings, the cost of the buildings, and the council, the commissioners, they've come back to the commissioners now, and the commissioners are doing the right thing. They said to this group, bring us a plan of what buildings they are, what they're gonna be used for, uh, you know, give us a business plan. You know, they presented, they presented a business plan, but I'm sorry, it doesn't, it does not provide the essential elements to make a good case to the commissioners to support the initiative. The key to the success of the fairgrounds project right now is approval of that 1% increase in the food and beverage tax. Now that must be done by the Indiana General Assembly and a bill that would increase that tax will be presented to legislators in January by our local delegation. Now officials like the chances of that happening but if it doesn't, revenue would then probably have to come from property tax revenues. And in a county with a dismal record for approving referendums for property tax increases, that would make the future of the project very uncertain. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the newsroom. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, the new Star Wars movie is going to be a blockbuster. There's, there's no question about that. And a lot of fans uh, might not realize that there's a vast body of works from books to comics to video games uh, that has accumulated since the original movie Absolutely. came out in 1977. Jesse Kelyo from the Hancock County Public Library is here to talk about ways that you can enhance your Star Wars experience before the movie comes out. Uh, some of the most interesting and entertaining works, uh, Jesse, when you and I were talking about this before, right. are part of the so-called Expanded Universe series. Expanded Universe, that's series. Mm -hmm. um, There are lots of books. The library has a lot of volumes in absolutely. the Expanded Universe. Mm -hmm. um, give us two titles uh, that readers would be really good to dive into as they see the new movie. Sure, I mean, with the Star, the Extended Universe not being canon anymore, one of the things that, uh, two things I'd recommend are books called uh, Death Troopers and Mall Lockdown by Joe Schreiber. They're two books that um, are more fun and, and they don't um, necessarily tie into character, I mean the characters you love, but it's just, they're just great fun reads. Death Troopers has zombie stormtroopers and Mall Lockdown is basically Darth Maul fighting in a prison. Just a lot of fun and who cares if they don't count anymore? So yeah, they're just a lot of fun. And so what, what has happened is the, the owners of the Star Wars franchise mm -hmm. have basically wiped out all those plots of all those books. Right. So they don't count anymore. Exactly. Um, and so going forward, we'll have brand new character development and plots in, in the movies, which is very shrewd thinking on the part of the... I do, um, I think so. And yeah. it allows the, the new stories to be told. Okay, let's talk about um, Brushing up on Star Wars history because mm -hmm. there's six there's six movies going back 38 years, right? Long before a lot of people who watched the movie were even yeah. were even born, mm -hmm. and hopefully most people have seen them uh, right. because they're preludes to to what's going on here. Um, but you also have some books at the library that would be a good place to start to go back and catch up with the story, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about those. 
Sure. I mean, there's even uh, some kids' books that actually retell the original stories. Like there's um, one for a New Hope called The Princess, the Scoundrel, and the Farm Boy, uh, Empire Strikes Back, so you want to be a Jedi, and Return of the Jedi, Be Beware of the Dark Side, that are, are for kids, but they're an interesting new retelling of these stories, and each has their own angle, each is written by a different author. So if you want to revisit them in a new light, even if you're an adult, I think they're kind of fun books, and they're fun to read with kids, too. And are they, are they good companions to the, to the original movies? Yes, naturally. They went back to the original screenplays and took some plot elements that weren't necessarily in the films and incorporated them. And so it's a very interesting way of re-exploring films you're very familiar with. Okay. Um, all right, let's talk now about the new movie. Mm -hmm. And you have some books at the library that kind of fill in some of the backstory behind what the new movie might be about. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about those? Sure. And there's um, books like Aftermath, um, Star Wars Journey, uh, Journey to Star Wars The Force Awakens, which is a book that takes place before the new film. It fills in some of the stuff going on before. Not, no major plot reveals, but it's, it's a new one of those. There's a teen book called The um, Lost Stars by Claudia Gray that is also um, takes place before the film. And there's a, one that still hasn't been released yet called Shattered Empire that's also coming out, tying into the new film. Um, lots of good books coming out. Let me back up for a minute to, sure. to the history because you brought with you yes, today absolutely. a couple of coffee table books that would be just good books to browse. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, for any fan of the films like this one, The Making of Empire Strikes Back, gorgeous book, so many behind the scenes pictures and details, more than you'd ever want to know. And there's also The Making of Return of the Jedi, also a fantastic read. Um, and you learn more than you ever want to know about the making of these films. Excellent, excellent. Jesse, thanks for joining us. Thanks My for, pleasure. for uh, sharing Thank you. with you the fact that there are a lot of books at the library about these movies and about the stories that go back uh, many years, 38 years I think it's been since the first movie came out. We appreciate you being with us, as, as always. Uh, that's our report for this week. Uh, thank you for uh, visiting the newsroom today. I'm Dave Hill for Nine Star Newsroom. As always, feel free to reach out to us and let us know what you think. Uh, may the force be with you.